Welcome to this edition of AOTV News, I'm Tony Beauvais. In today's show, AOTV News, the Melbourne Fringe Festival, Leonardo da Vinci at the Loom, Regaro Gomo book launch, ARTV magazine and more. Darling and Daring Productions presents a sexy night of circus, spice and all things nice. In their filthy, flirty circus cabaret, the Carnival of Characters. Featuring a playful and provocative cast in a night of dangerous games, hilarity and mystique, Carnival of Characters is filled to the brim with acrobats and sexy jokes. Step into a world where the daring meets dazzling in a seductive circus cabaret experience. Strictly adult carnival entertainment for everyone. For further information, see the Alex Theatre website. The annual Fuse Festival kicks off this month, transforming the Darabin area into a dynamic hub for the creative arts. Hosting events every autumn and spring, Fuse at Large has been committed to pushing the boundaries of artistic expression while celebrating the vibrant culture of Darabin. The free festival will host various live events, including music concerts, art galleries, film screenings and design competitions. To celebrate Victoria's upcoming Seniors Month in October, performance outfit Not Done Yet will return to the festival. Exclusively featuring talents over the age of 55, Not Done Yet aims to challenge expectations of how seniors should behave in public through choreographed performance, slapstick and dance. The Bandura Homestead Arts Centre will play host to two new exhibitions, engaging with the expansion of the gallery's second floor. The Heritage Listed Homestead will feature artwork presented by the artist-run gallery Working at Heights. Five rooms and house rule will run to the 23rd of November. For more information on events and ticketing, head to the website. The National Institute of Circus Arts cathartic new ensemble show Fall With Me was presented last month at the National Circus Centre in Paran. As Australia's centre of excellence for training in the contemporary arts, NICA's last show planned to explore complex human emotion through contemporary circus performance. The second year ensemble was directed by theatrical storyteller Katie Cawthorn and aims to explore the intricacies of the human psyche. The performance featured acts of teeterboard, hair hanging and Chinese pole and delivered an electric and emotional show. Head to the NICA website to check out what's going on with their latest productions. Colin Epsworth is presenting My Colt and I, a story that follows Colin's parents being matched at random in a mass wedding at New York's Madison Square Gardens in the 80s by a man who said he was Jesus Christ. Through a mix of theatre and comedy, My Colt and I explores the inner workings of why people join cults and the universal search for connection, belonging and purpose. My Colt and I is at the Music Room at Festival Hub Trades Hall. See the Fringe website for further details. It's August 2021. Kath is up to Pussy's Bow in Sourdough. Kim's been asked to work from home, though that happened before the pandemic. And Sharon has had a severe reaction to all the hand sanitizers. Relive the uniquely Melbourneian pandemic experience of Kath and Kim through the eyes of these uniquely Melbourneian characters hilariously parodied by Art Simone with Thomas Jaspers, Lisa Mann, and Scott Brennan. Returning to St Kilda's Alex Theatre after sold out seasons in Geelong, Ballarat, Albury, Canberra, the Gold Coast and the Sydney Opera House, with Quick Wit and Camp Tunes, this is a fabulous night out for everyone. Fountain Lakes in Lockdown, a drag parody at the Alex Theatre. See the website for details. The Melbourne Fringe Festival is back in October transforming the city into a vibrant canvas of artistic expression. Over two and a half weeks, this dynamic festival invites the audience to explore both daring performance in theatres, galleries, public spaces, and unexpected locations across Melbourne. This year's program brings together some of the most groundbreaking performers from Australia and beyond, featuring everything from circus, dance, and physical theatre to comedy, cabaret, and music. Highlights include Cutting Edge Eggs, Light Dance North Australia, Jack Circus, and Camera Dance. Melbourne Fringe offers over 450 unique events blending art, bold ideas, and a touch of mischief. 
there's something for everyone. Whether you're seeking moments of joy, reflection, or pure entertainment. From Dream Swarm, a whimsical performance for children, to the spectacular outdoor event. Free Fairy Floss, when now perform aerial, acrobatics, with candy clouds, the festival promises, an unforgettable experience. Don't miss the festival hub at Chase Hall, which will host over 100 events, including the iconic Global Smash Club, celebrating 20 years of the legendary burlesque hour. The Melbourne Fringe Festival celebrates diversity, creativity, and the unexpected. Tickets and full program details are now available. The Loom is running an extraordinary exhibition. Embark on a vibrant exploration of Leonardo da Vinci's life. Surrounded by the vivid hues of his original notebook pages, vibrant machine inventions manifested from his sketches, and a digital canvas depicting his remarkable journey. Immerse yourself in a spectrum of colours through AI and VR technologies, breathing new life into his iconic works. Witness the world's only exact 360 degree replica of the Mona Lisa, radiating with an array of vibrant hues. Indulge in a renaissance themed dining experience where every dish is a masterpiece. Join us on this colourful odyssey through the genius of Leonardo da Vinci. The Leonardo da Vinci experience includes a showcase of 40 machine inventions, painstakingly crafted by skilled Italian artisans and on loan from the Museo Leonardo da Vinci in Rome. This vibrant exhibition showcases digital art, awe-inspiring artefacts and original pages from Leonardo's notebooks painting a vivid portrait of his unparalleled brilliance. As part of the Leonardo da Vinci experience, the Loom Melbourne is proud to display original pages from the genius's precious Codex Atlanticus notebook, revealing his insatiable curiosity spanning anatomy, engineering, flying machines and hydraulic systems. This is the first time these original sketches have been shown in Australia, representing a once-in-a-generation opportunity for insight and inspiration. Immerse yourself in a kaleidoscope of colours as we celebrate the life of history's greatest creative genius, Leonardo da Vinci, in 500 years of genius presented by WeBuild. Visit the website for further details. Monash University Performing Arts Centre is set to host Wayfinder, a dynamic and emotionally charged performance by Dance North Australia. This electrifying production, hailing from Townsville, Guam Bilbara, seamlessly blends contemporary dance, visual art and music, promising an unforgettable experience. Directed by the talented duo Amber Haynes and Carl Page, Wayfinder features an evocative score by three-time Grammy-nominated Australian band Hiatus, Coyote and sound artist Byron J. Scullin. The music, described as soaring composition, creates an atmosphere that speaks to our sensory nature, highlighting the importance of connection in the universe. The visual aspect of Wayfinder is equally striking, thanks to the work of renowned interdisciplinary artist Hiromi Tango, whose costume design and visual art infuse the performance with an explosion of colour, texture and shapes. Her work, which has been featured in international exhibitions across the United States, Belgium, Dubai and throughout the Asia-Pacific region, including Singapore, South Korea, Japan, Indonesia and New Zealand. Their dedication to creating high-quality performances has earned them numerous accolades, including two Helpman Awards, two Australian Dance Awards and the prestigious Sydney Meyer Performing Arts Group Award. Wayfinder marks Dance North's return to MPAC after a five-year hiatus, their last performance being dust in 2019. Dance North is known for its adventurous and critically acclaimed productions, having presented work in over 45 international art festivals and venues worldwide. MPAC, a cultural hub of Monash University, continues to act as a centre for the arts in Melbourne's southeast, connecting the university with the broader community through its diverse and engaging programs. With five venues across its Clayton and Peninsula campuses, MPAC remains committed to bringing exceptional local, national and international talent to its stages on October 18-19 at the Alexander Theatre. 
Last week, Rigare Gomo launched his new book, Dreams Forging My Own Path. Rigare is one of the first black, gay, African Australians to write his life story and share it with the world. In 2001, Rigare left Zimbabwe and came to Australia with one suitcase, a backpack, and about $300 when he was just 16 years old in search of a better life. This memoir follows his extraordinary journey. His unwavering resilience and determination, which led him from the streets of Zimbabwe to the bustling cities of Australia. Born stateless in the UK to Zimbabwean parents, Rigare's story is a powerful testament to the indomitable human spirit and the transformative power of embracing one's authentic self. It's been a very long journey. You see, I, were, I grew up in Zimbabwe. And in Zimbabwe, there are limited opportunities, but also to be a gay person, you can go to prison and jail. So I grew up in a context that I am an abomination to be eradicated. So coming to Australia for me was my journey, my path to freedom. So I had lots of limiting beliefs about myself, but so many everyday Australians contributed to me to heal my trauma and for me to discover who I truly am. When I then went into law school and then you know, trained as a lawyer at Maddox Lawyers, I discovered that I wanted to do more. I saw myself helping so many people as a lawyer, but I wanted to be a decision maker. So I didn't want to be the advisor. I wanted to see for myself what it would be like to be an ultimate decision maker and having that responsibility like the clients who were coming to us. And that was the making of me because then I could really develop what are my value systems, how will I show up to help people, how will I treat my team. So that in itself has been an extraordinary journey. Throughout his memoir, Gomo shares intimate details of his life from his childhood in Zimbabwe, where he grappled with his identity and sexuality, to his arrival in Australia, where he faced countless obstacles as he sought to build a new life for himself. The idea of the book is the end to trauma and the discovery of self-love. So for me, some of the key milestones, of course, in my life were coming to Australia, but also entering into the legal profession, a person like me couldn't easily enter the profession. I was an international student, and so those doors were closed for me in the applications because you needed to be an Australian citizen or an Australian permanent resident. So I had to figure out opening doors that were closed for me. The other thing was, of course, um, in corporate Australia, it's predominantly a white corporate Australia, and I'm typically the only black person in the room. So I had to also learn how to connect with different cultures. For example, the AFL, you know, <laughs> I didn't grow up with AFL, but AFL is a great, you know, platform for people for connecting. So I've had to learn a lot um, about what it is to be Australian. So even though I spoke English, it's not enough, you know, but what I have grown to love is how Australia gets to connect over the AFL, over the barbecue, the barbie. And so that has been also a wonderful addition to my life. Despite the challenges he encounters, including financial hardships, discrimination, and personal struggles, Gomo refuses to let his circumstances define him. Every single person is exactly the same. So even though I'm, I have had many challenges, all of us have challenges. You know, may, there may be the challenge of being a woman and having to be a mother, you know, or creating your career. They're challenges. Or one of the people I mentor, being Sikh himself, he had the challenge of if he stops wearing the turban, what will his community think about him? So for me, what my book does is to highlight that we are really all the same. There isn't just one agenda. Yes, gay rights is important, but women's rights is important. Women's rights was the precursor for gay rights. So in this world where there seems to be more isolation by just choosing causes, what my book is demonstrating is that we are all one, whether we are in China, India, Britain, Zimbabwe, we are all one with our challenges and all there is is for us to support each other. In short, what my message is is my freedom must elevate the freedom of others. My opportunities must also open opportunities for others. As readers follow Gomo's journey, they witness the profound impact of vulnerability, community, and the unbreakable bonds of family and friendship. 
Gomo's story is one of self-discovery as he learns to embrace his truths, chase his dreams, and create a life of purpose and meaning. Though we have equality in marriage in Australia, even though people like me have more opportunity, our work isn't done. You know, if I were to go to Nigeria, I would be killed. If I were to go to Uganda, I would be killed. So we shouldn't just take our freedom and now be comfortable with it. I think all of us, all us human beings, um, have a responsibility to also elevate others even outside our own country. I'm here, we're talking about a very um, confronting book and mm -hmm. topic. Mm -hmm. um, but let's start off with some business stuff. Sure. So talk to me about this publishing and publication. It's uh, Grinadara Press. Grinadara Press. Grinadara yeah, Press. Yeah, I can tell you the background. I've actually been bequeathed this publishing house. It's been run for 28 years. And my very dear friend, he's very, very terminally ill and he didn't want his publishing house to die with him, effectively, to put it bluntly. Um, so it's, you know, it's emotional and it's a legacy that I intend to maintain. I'm, I've inherited a lot of projects that were works in, pro in progress, but this particular title I was working on as an independent publishing consultant and I was helping the author. And then when she heard that I was being given a publishing house, she said, please let me publish with you. So that's how, how that's come wow. about. Mm. So how much are you going to be driven by guilt? You're Jewish. <laughs> guilt is part of your, it's I'm endemic. Jewish, it's you're endemic. Jewish. <laughs> There's guilt flowing everywhere. I know. I've got a bit of guilt because I've got all these authors that are waiting and then I've got this book that's kind of come in and that's kind of, because the author's coming out in in um, October, all the way from Mallorca where yeah, she now lives. so we have to explain that she's Australian. Yes. Sydney-born. Yep. Went, was financially successful in Sydney. Correct. And oh, then went to London and had an unhappy marriage mm -hmm. and then ended up in Mallorca. Correct, where she's been for many years and she's a sculptor. But yes, that's right, she's <laughs> a sculptor. Like, yeah, nauseating. She's a, I know, she's nauseating. incredibly talented. But what happened right at the beginning, I mean, you know, we'll get to it, but the traumatic childhood was somehow she pulled herself out of that and she got a job in real estate when she could, you know, she, she didn't leave school with the graduation papers because she'd lost the ability to read and to retain information through trauma but she got a job in a real estate agent and eventually she said to her boss if you buy that property i'll help you renovate it and it was on the cusp of paddington's gentrification and from there she made a small fortune she became this sort of baron of paddington and set up her own wow. agency baroness, baroness correct <laughs> <laughs> and so. um and yeah it was just a timing and also a creativity and an ability to to make things out of, you know, effectively nothing. And in the day, Paddington was a slum. That's right. If I can just explain to the poor old Melburnians or non Sydney <laughs> siders who are watching this, Paddington's sort of between Centennial Park and the um, and uh, Double Bay. Yep, it's absolutely. It's on the cusp, but it's in. It's at the start of the eastern suburbs, so really. Oxford it's Street. not. It's not a um, a harbourside suburb. No, but it's got those beautiful double sized terraces and yeah, they're, they're but iconic. It's got the iconic Paddington Terrace. Yep. And um, yeah, it was a slum, but now it's super groovy and has Absolutely. been for decade after decade. Yep. And we've got Judy to thank partially for that because she had the vision and she started this regeneration, I guess, of the um, houses. And, and yeah, she was able to sort of take off and try and put behind her the past but it keeps bubbling up, of course. So can I just warn people, mm, um, we're talking one. about uh, Agnes. This is the name of the book. It's by Judy King. It's called A Childhood Betrayed and Reclaimed. And as you can hear, she has had an amazing career. Um, let's, it's about um, sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So if I can just warn everyone, if you find this sort of stuff triggering, who doesn't? Mm. Be careful. The start of the book 
starts in London with her uh, dad husband. So mm -hmm. she had a dad husband. Second dad husband. <laughs> She's got a talent for spotting them. Well, it's part of the trauma. We're easy to spot. <laughs> that husbands are easy to spot. Um, we're, you know, every second one of us is pretty dud. Um, <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> no, nah, but I'm having a bit of remorse about <laughs> my own spectacularly unhusbandly self. Um, so... That's where she started. I thought that was a funny yeah. place to start. Yeah, but it's about her getting on the plane to come back home at the behest of her ageing narcissistic mother, as it says on the back God, cover. she didn't spare the mum. Oh, the mum is the villain. The mum, the father, the extended family. I mean, she was just literally a subject of abuse from all quarters. But then there'd be these external people providing kindness but they were always short-lived because something would happen that would traumatically cut an end they'd to... They'd die. Yes. They'd leave. They'd leave or they'd cut her out once they kind of like had too close a shave with her awful parents. I yeah. mean, they were shocking. So... But you can her, imagine yeah. encountering that family unit mm. would be a bit of a turn-off. Oh, constantly. And despite all of this, Agnes is literally Agnes of God. I mean, she is like this angelic child. Even the cover of the book is this sort of The shiny. cover of the book, there's this, it's beautifully artistically rendered because mm. it's a black and white with sort of grey and then yep. there's, there's Agnes or Judy. Yep, it is Judy. It's Judy, you know, this beatific Exactly. And in the Strand Arcade. So the other thing about the book is that she she captures the essence of post-war Sydney so magnificently. It's like you're walking through the streets and recalling places and times, historical events that happened while she was young. And she'd sort of read snippets of news that she'd find in her mother's knitting bag. And so you kind of, it's contextualised in a way that gives such a sort of resonance to the book. So it's not yeah. just all trauma. It's beautifully written, which makes it easier to kind of, you know, stomach. And, and just to revisit, I, I lived in post-war yeah. Sydney. See, I'm and a little my, bit younger. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just about to turn 70. Anyway, um, so uh, my dad would sit on some of those harbour beaches yep. and say to my grandfather, Uncle Abe, as yep. you call him, um, this is the most beautiful city in the world. Yep. And for a Melbourneian to admit that must have been <laughs> deeply painful. <laughs> I mean, we hate Sydney. I've got this divided loyalty because I've lived here 17 yeah, years I and I love Melbourne, but you can't compare the physicality of it. And now you're, all, you're stuck it. here, aren't you? Yeah, I'm stuck here. My yeah. kids are Melburnians, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have this, in my mind, I've got this whole um, contradiction where mm. you've got Post-war Sydney, amazing, mm -hmm. beautiful. People have houses adjacent to the harbour yep. ha or the surf beaches. Yep. But even the leafy North Shore, she yeah. describes. She describes Gordon Station, which is where I caught the train to school every day. She describes, you know, just down to the, the gardens and, and how from Chatswood to Roseville, the style of the houses changed. She's got this, despite having lost so much of her memory, like huge chunks of her childhood, she is so, in her writing, in her 60s, able to recapture yeah. all of this sort of, you know, the, the beauty, the physical essence. And she remembers tiny, the minutiae, the detail, in terms of, you know, trips to David Jones, the fashion labels that her mother would buy. I mean, it, DJs was yeah. just such a thing. It's iconic. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't on the road to Melbourne, uh, to Sydney Uni? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, in the middle of the city. And yeah. I mean, they probably didn't, well, so they didn't have sort of Chatswood Chase at Westfield Plazas back then. So everybody went to the yeah. city to do their shopping. Um, you know, but you talk about the makeup counter and Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubenstein. And I mean, these names aren't necessarily iconic these days, but you're drawn back into that era. Yeah, it's, amazing. It's pretty, it's pretty so incredible. So what, what do you want to say about the abuse? Oh, it's so traumatic. And there are so many incidences and every single page that is a page turner. Every page is sort of on the edge of your seat thinking. Dripping with. Trauma. Trauma, yeah. <laughs> it, it, and then there's this sort of like ability for Agnes to sort of keep coming through. Her way of 
repressing and disassociating and actually then there's that sense of self-shame not understanding what's happening to her thinking must be something that she's done she must be guilty somehow she turns to god she's brought up in these convents i think the school she went to it she talks about the brother schools, which is so Aloysius Kira Billy, and it's on the North Shore. Yeah, so she's she's living she's a in North Shore girl. North Shore girl. She goes from Gordon, where a very ter the first trauma, which is gripping. I mean, edge of your seat gripping, and it actually happened. And there's a Sydney Morning Herald article that she still has to this day mm. about that particular event, which I can tell you if it's not giving away too much. Um, Up to you. Okay. So she had this beautiful neighbour. She was, you know, she didn't know that she was in an abusive family environment because she's a little girl, so it's just what she knew. But she had this really good friendship with this boy who was a few years older. Her, his parents were Holocaust survivors. They lived in Gordon and he, his dad's a scientist and she's they're always there with them learning and she's holding his hand one day and there's been a massive storm and outside her house is a hanging wire. He holds the wire, he gets electrocuted, he dies in front of her. She's let go of his hand. Somehow she survived. She finds out later that her mother made sure she was wearing gum boots. So her mother had seen the wire, not done anything about it, but the parents blamed her for this child's death. I mean, it's a trauma that you can't imagine, and it's in the newspapers. She's changed the names <laughs> in the book, yeah. um, but that was the beginning of the time. I mean, how terrible is that? Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. Their only child. Their only, only child, God. And so there's that resonance of, you know, this post-war era, the kindness of others, the lack of kindness at home, which just makes it all the more apparent, but her trying to reconcile because she loves her mummy and daddy and she's always trying to think the best of them. So, you know, just, it, it's, it's unnerving, but it's compelling. Thanks very much for coming in, Vora. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That's my new name. <laughs> and um, Deborah Lee, who's the publisher of this great, interesting, confronting, but ultimately uplifting book, yeah. Agnes, A Childhood Betrayed and Reclaimed by Judy King. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's it for this edition. If you'd like to get in touch with us and let us know about any live event coming up in the inner Melbourne region within the next month, just shoot us an email at info at artv.com.au. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.